In that odyssey of creating playgrounds uh, for the last, well, for at least 15 years, I've been a landscape architect for 25. Most, more recently, it took me here to Brooklyn, but it started back here um, in Lower Manhattan in Battery Park City when our firm won a commission to design a play space for children in this space amongst these tall buildings. And the, the conundrum was that right next to it had just opened a kind of state-of-the-art conventional playground with all the bells and whistles. So the question was, what are you going to do? Or just more of that? Or So getting a play commission makes you think about how you played or how you were when you were a kid. And so growing up in, in uh, Homedale and having a, uh, a kind of semi-rural upbringing, I noticed it, it really afforded me with many opportunities for self-determination. And whether that is climbing trees or uh, catching frogs or uh, playing in the dirt or imagining that a, a log pile was a fortress that needs to be defended, um, all of these things, it, the, the, the environment was rich with opportunity. Um, and, and what I realized, though, is that didn't translate directly um, to New York City. Obviously, we have real dangers. We have cars to get run over by, manholes to fall into. We have perceived dangers that keep us in our apartments, uh, you know, maybe just watching TV or something like that. Uh, and so in critiquing the conventional playground, though, uh, I realized that the city was a different context. Our kids nowadays are a different context. But in critiquing the uh, conventional playground, um, looking at it through the lens of my own play experience, uh, we started to develop this idea that a robust naturalism um, was a kind of setting that fostered creativity and socialization and uh, self-determination. So this kind of started us on our way in the design of Teardrop. And uh, it, this has taken us on a journey um, of designing play spaces in cities. And what I'd like to do now is take you on a visual tour of various of those spaces and tell you a few of my uh, observations made along the way. So the first part, the first challenge of making a play space is you have to figure out what are the missing experiences in your target audience's lives, okay? And uh, so obviously a natural environment for most city kids is a missing experience, at least at, on, on a daily basis, and it's a missing experience in their um, uh, in their schoolyard as well. Um, and, so, and we really feel like a, 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 a natural environment like this fosters creativity, play acting, and uh, imagination. A, a naturally inspired uh, environment also invites children to figure out how they're going to use a space. Um, dramatic use of materials and space can draw kids out to interact, become aware of themselves, and others. So play is the creation of substitute worlds. Playing is the creation, of, isn't that wonderful? And I realized, I only read this very recently, but I realized that's sort of what I try to do, is create substitute worlds. Here in, in Brooklyn Bridge Park, there's um, this idea of a substitute world could become a kind of springboard for kids to play in and then create their own substitute world. So here, swings are combined with this kind of sculpted undulating ground plane, ensconced in this flower garden that is, features flower shrubs that bloom in the summer that you might have at your beach house if you had a beach house, or in this substitute world, uh, plants and rocks and water in various uh, expected and unexpected expressions transports these kids into a kind of dreamland and elicits a kind of playfulness that would absolutely be you know, all wrong on the street or maybe in a more ordinary play environment. Or in this substitute world, the little misanthrope that's a part of all of us um, can get away and, uh, and discover through textures and detail um, in a setting that changes uh, uh, dramatically uh, with the seasons. So play is, is endless and limitless, and the creation of play spaces is a, as well. And recently, I went to Europe, and in Germany, I met Gunther Belzig, who that was his quote earlier. And 
Gunther is relentless in inventing and reinventing play spaces, uh, and play uh, equipment, actually. Um, and then I also, a part of that trip, went to Stockholm and saw this wonderful new playground, um, which featured equipment by a Danish firm called Monstrum. Um, and the, uh, form, the uh, founder of the firm is as an artist who clearly is influenced by surreal juxtaposition. He's using it in a wonderful way here. I think you'd agree. Um, and then these beetles, uh, which are at the same time uh, kind of scary and really fun. So back uh, in the office in our creative process, which is a very playful process, I think that's been confirmed today, um, the importance of that. It's one of endless discovery as well, and it features tinkering um, and making and trial and error uh, every day. The play spaces uh, as the parts of the parks always take the longest uh, because they're complex, social, functional, aesthetic environments, and they have a myriad of very complex uh, uh, critical details to take care of. So um, this idea of a re relentless pursuit that characterizes the creative process is also carried through into how we imagine people using our spaces. We always like to have an aspect of it that kind of eludes uh, immediate discovery and uh, rewards only the, uh, the searcher with the kind of full potential of the space. So in this, in, in, in this environment, kids, uh, city kids, especially sophisticated city kids, are kind of easily distracted and bored. And here we use a kind of sense of mystery to draw kids out um, into interaction with each other and the space. We also really try to design from a child's perspective and making miniature worlds that are scaled to the child. They're small, remember. And in this case, literally what I mean is eye height of a child, where this space feels like a miniature Grand Canyon to them, and to an adult it's kind of a manage, um, manageable but not really that big space. Or from a child's perspective, what are they interested in terms of nooks and crannies? What would they find interesting? Or maybe from a child's perspective, what's exciting, okay? And what's exciting might be something that's unexpected um, in, in, in what they would uh, normally find. And so here, this very high, very steep slide appears suddenly in an otherwise very naturalistic park. It's the only piece of play equipment there. So we've learned that play is learning. Um, that's a good reference there. And so if we could ex uh, expand um, the uh, sense of discovery in the play process, we expand that learning opportunity. So here in Hoboken, a kid could look up at that and say, how do I do that? And then, next please, okay. And then they can uh, find these kind of wooden steps that don't look like steps, and they go up to this platform, and then they get into a base of a tube that only they can fit in, and they crawl up the tube, and they get onto the balcony up on top, they get a sweeping view of Manhattan, and then they shoot back down the slide through the treetops, back down to the bottom, and of course, all parents know that will end, result in endless loops of doing that over and over until <laughs> the sun goes down. Um, another really important thing about play is, from our perspective, is don't make it easy. I think we have realized as a society, at least in certain domains, that the elimination of risk is actually ultimately dangerous. Um, and we find that to, uh, manifested in TED Talks about five dangerous things to teach your kids to do, and books that are all about this crisis of over, over protection. So learning is a form of information gathering. Uh, we've also heard that today. And uh, so uh, a kid learning on an individual scale is similar to Nate, the way nature learns. Nature uses environmental stressors to input into the system and improve the system over overall. And if those stressors are avoided, the system becomes vulnerable. So play means sampling, creating all kinds of opportunities and all kinds of challenges. So uh, it might be social challenges, kind of unplanned mixing of kids of different ages and different backgrounds. 
or physical challenges, and it's always good to have choices. So here the little kids stay at the bottom and play around in the nooks and crannies of the rocks, where the older kids take on the challenge and go up to the top. Um, or it might be the challenge of wondering whether you're actually going to listen to your mother or not. <laughs> so it's all about creating a really rich environment suffused with a myriad of sensorial inputs. So how do you make a rich environment? From a design perspective, I say get rid of abstraction and embrace complexity. A complex environment is how you hedge your bets, creating many opportunities for the unpredictable array of moods and interests and needs and abilities that you're going to come across. A uh, complex environment is where uh, a child can choose how they want to interact with other children at any particular moment. So one obvious tool you've seen here that we love to use to create complex environments is a rich infusion of planting. Um, you get lots of detail and lots of texture. You get the permutations of the seasons. You get uh, sensorial inputs that go beyond the visual. You get play objects. You get sticks. You get bark. You get flowers, which they always pick in this park here. And you get seed pods, and that's all part of, of, the, of the experience. So it's a changing situation. You want to provide many opportunities because one kid is not the same, as we all know, before lunch as they are after lunch, much less different kids or different parts of the, their lives. So here in Union Square Park, we packed this thing full of programming, and the planting is what helps us pull it all off, where you can see just look at this picture for a second. Look at all the different things that are happening in kind of an improbable juxtaposition to each other. So for instance, in this toddler swing area, the grasses create this calm, peaceful little moment where the kids can uh, be toddlers. But literally two feet away in the sand play area is this kind of New York City you know, level of madness going on. <laughs> so. This is um, about a, a natural environment um, creating, becoming a platform for public space. And of course, a platform for public space, a platform for imagination, a platform for substitute worlds. Uh, of course, this draws a straight line right back to the genius who created Central Park, Olmsted, who, I, you know, paradoxically, uh, realized that the for he had to invent the form of this first park, and he said it should be inspired by the countryside. So at, like Olmsted, um, akin to Olmsted, uh, establishing for all of us that parks are essential to a successful city, what I'm saying here is that imaginative play spaces should be considered essential infrastructure to the contemporary, contemporary livable city. And of course, we all know that our kids can, especially if we're trying to get somewhere, play anywhere, right? They really can. And so it's kind of, it's funny that it's actually so, so hard to design a good children's play space. Um, but sometimes you can strike on the kind of magic mix where you're making something that's needed and something that's mysterious uh, and, and something that's challenging and something that's satisfyingly rich. And I feel like our cities need to step up to the challenge. So thank you.